When I'm painting, there's no question that my favorite tool is an airbrush with acrylic paint. Since these are both relatively new in relation to other mediums in art history, I thought that it might be interesting to see if we can get an acrylic airbrush painting to look like an old master's oil painting. So I stopped by the Met in New York City to see some of my favorite paintings. If you've ever been to the Met, you'll know that there's so much art there that it's easy to get overwhelmed very quickly. Every time I leave the museum, I realize that I missed something that I wanted to see. There's just too much amazing art at the Met that it's really impossible to see it all in a single visit. On this channel, we already painted a Caravaggio, an Ang, and a painting by Albert Bierstadt. And since we paint a lot of portraits on this channel, I thought it would be fun to copy one of the best portrait painters that ever lived, and that's Rembrandt. Rembrandt was far more than just being a portrait painter. He was one of the few artists, especially among the masters of the Dutch Golden Age, who painted everything. It's almost impossible to find a painting style or subject that Rembrandt wasn't great at. From genre paintings to landscapes, allegorical and biblical scenes filled with iconography, thousands of drawings and studies, and what we're here to copy, his portraits, most notably his self-portraits. Rembrandt was a master draftsman and he painted and practiced constantly. That's why during his life, he painted around 40 self-portraits. And just like the Caravaggio painting that we copied, I'm sure that some of you watching may think that some of these paintings might seem a bit grim or dreary. A lot of classical literature and art deals with tragedy. There's no way around that. And since Rembrandt was so well read, a lot of that influenced his work. Now tragedy, going back to the ancient Greeks or someone later like Shakespeare, all deal with the difficult parts of life. And it's a reason that it's at the core of classical literature and art. And while many of the great thinkers, philosophers, and artists throughout history didn't always have the answers, reading and learning from them could be very cathartic and make you feel less alone when things seem difficult. And that's why art history will always be a part of this YouTube channel. Painting has always been so much more than flashy techniques because art at its core is about what it is to be a human being. But that's not to say that painting technique always sits behind concept and thought. The artists that I've always most admired were masters at both and Rembrandt sits very, very high on that list. So in this video, we're going to be copying this self-portrait, which is located at the Met in New York City. A lot of theories about why Rembrandt painted so many self-portraits can be found if you look around. From being the first artist to develop the self-portrait as a form of self-expression and introspection, to use as a teaching guide for his students to copy and learn from, or just for financial reasons by selling them to his patrons and collectors. And a lot of these are probably true, but there's definitely a good amount of speculation involved. I've thought about this a lot over the years and this is probably going to sound overly simple but I just think Rembrandt loved to paint and that's what he did. Of course he was very successful during the majority of his life and career as a painter but to me his self-portraits are all about the love of painting. He started painting these when he was very young and continued right up to his death and these were painted through the good times of his life and through the very bad times. Each one shows his ever-changing development in style, from his playful and lighthearted paintings and etchings that focused on facial expressions, often referred to as tronies, and to his later paintings showing off his signature impasto layering of paint. If you ever have the opportunity, you should definitely check out some of these in person, because they almost have a 3D effect where the paint is layered on so thick, almost like a sculptor. And like most great artists, he took plenty of inspiration from the painters that came before him. So regardless of why Rembrandt painted so many self-portraits, they provide an incredible autobiography of the artist. And if we all pay attention, there's a lot we could learn. So before we start this painting, let me just preface it by saying that I'm no Rembrandt and I'll never be able to paint anywhere near his abilities. But the reason that we copy is to learn from the artists that we love, and that's what this one's about. Since this portrait is pretty difficult to paint, I'm going to leave out a lot of the simple stuff so that we can keep this video concise. So in starting out, I set up a very smooth canvas that I prepared myself, and then I transferred over my initial line drawing using a one by one grid. And what I'm doing here is going around with the eraser and just cleaning up and erasing out some of the grid lines on the important parts of the portrait. I'm also using a kneaded eraser. This way I could lighten up my initial contour lines because I'm gonna be using transparent paint for this whole painting. 
Now this is probably very obvious, but I just want to point this out that Rembrandt painted nothing like this. He was an oil painter and he built up his layers using thick opaque paint. We're actually going to be using the opposite technique in this one where we're erasing into the paint to pull out highlights from the canvas underneath. So very similar to drawing. So even though the two techniques are drastically different, we're going to see if we can get pretty close to that oil painting look at the end of this one. I'm placing up Rembrandt's completed self-portrait on the left side of the screen so you can see what we're painting towards. Just like all the other portraits that I painted on this channel, I'm starting with the left eye. That's just most comfortable for me, but you could start wherever you'd like. I'm using Createx illustration colors in my airbrush, and since I'm painting this on that very smooth canvas, I'm able to erase and scratch off the paint. So the first thing I'm doing here is using some shields to define the sharp outlines in some areas around the eye. You can see I started along the outside of the iris. This is where the limbal ring is. And then also in the center where the pupil is. I'm spraying here at around 20 PSI and I'm mainly spraying on the shield itself. This way, some of the paint gets left on the canvas, giving us that outline. I'm also gonna use a curve on this shield to place on that transition point between the sclera, which is the whites of the eye and the upper eyelid, lightly spraying some paint along that edge to give us another line. Once these lines and reference points are in, I can start using the airbrush freehand, focusing on some of the gradations and transition of values. If you look at Rembrandt's completed painting on the left side of the screen, you could just see how dark he painted the eyes. There's a dark shadow toward the top of the iris where the upper eyelid is casting a shadow down below, and the pupil itself is almost pure black. Now I'm using transparent paints here, so in order to get a transparent paint dark, you add more of it, multiple layers. So I want to be careful at this point not to add too much paint. That way, if I make some mistakes, which I will, I'll be able to remove them and continue painting. Again, going back to Rembrandt's painting, you'll notice that a lot of the highlights, like this one on the upper eyelid, have a lot of texture to them. That's because he was using a brush with opaque paint. Now this is the complete opposite texture that you get when you're painting with an airbrush. An airbrush always gives you a soft and smooth transition between values. So how are we going to get that textured effect using an airbrush? There are a bunch of ways to go about this, but the main technique that I'm going to be using is an eraser by scratching and removing paint. As I said earlier, this is the opposite to Rembrandt's technique. He would lay the paint on thick where those highlights are. That way that paint catches light and shows a brighter area. But here we're erasing into the paint, showing that white gesso of the canvas underneath. So even though the two techniques and application of paint is very different, we could still achieve a similar illusion at the end. Because painting is really about adding a bunch of illusions together that form a final portrait in the end. So on this eyelid here, I'm just removing paint in some horizontal strokes, basically hatching like what you do with pencils or with charcoal. I want to set in this curve on this lower eyelid, so I'm going to use the same shield, place it over it, and you can see here I'm mainly spraying the paint on the shield itself. This way a small amount of that overspray gets onto the canvas. I'll use another side of my shield here to lay in this small shadow underneath the tear duct, and then I'm going to go back to the airbrush freehand and paint in the whites of the eye. For the majority of this portrait, I'm going to be only using this one flesh tone mixture. And the reason for that is because it's going to allow me to focus a lot more on the values, the darks and lights in this painting, rather than the colors. Working on this copy is exactly why I always say that observation is the most important skill you could learn. Now, I know a fair amount of anatomy. I studied it, especially in graduate school. I studied it quite a bit. And Rembrandt is kind of similar to what I was talking about in the Caravaggio painting and also in the Ang painting. A lot of the painters of the Italian Renaissance, people like Raphael and Michelangelo, painted and worked from casts, which were statues. Photography didn't exist and models were expensive, so painting from casts was one of the best ways to learn. And a lot of their portraits took on this sculptural look, especially around the eyes. And while I was working on this left eye, I realized that Rembrandt was kind of similar to the Italians a hundred years earlier. There's definitely some subtle exaggeration going on in Rembrandt's eyes, especially around the eyelids. Like the Italian masters, they're slightly protruding, not the way that you'd actually see them in nature. And this was clearly intentional, especially for Rembrandt, because he was always going for that sculptural look in his paintings. And again, this is why observation is so important, because I must have seen this painting maybe a hundred times in my life at the Met, and I don't think I ever really noticed the subtle exaggeration in the eyes here. This again, this is what's so cool about copying. You really learn things that you didn't know before. Now in the past, I've copied quite a few Rembrandt paintings, mostly in graphite, but a few in oil. 
and each one of those two, I always learned something new about them. Now I sharpened my eraser to a very sharp point just by running it through an electric pencil sharpener. This way I can erase out these two very thin highlights on this lower eyelid where he used a smaller brush with some lighter paint. It's important to note here that I'm going slowly on this painting. I'm not rushing to the final painting right away. I'm slowly building up my values and my textures. Because as I'm erasing here, I'm not only adding a highlight, but I'm also adjusting the shape of this lower eyelid. Highlights and shadows always define the structures in a portrait, so it's important to have them at the correct values, but also to have them in the correct places. So I'll just work my way around here with the eraser, adding some more subtle texture into this eye. If any area is too dark, I can go over it with the eraser very lightly to pull out a thin layer of paint to lighten it up. Another way that I'm going to try to mimic the brush strokes is painting in a few lines that are parallel to each other. That's what I'm doing here, just below the eyebrow. A few of these lines are going to give me some darker shadows, so later I can erase in between them. And we're really going to get that texture that almost looks like a brush came in very quickly, a dark shadow and a highlight. I also am going to add a few more of these parallel lines just to the left of the ones that I completed. And you can see in Rembrandt's painting that he used a smaller brush here to paint in a few dark lines for that shadow. When you look at the way that he painted the eyebrow, you'll notice that there's a lot of subtle hatching going on here. So I'm using my airbrush with this same color and lightly spraying in these lines. It's very important that I spray a small amount of paint in. This way, the value is going to be lighter. If I want to make it darker later, I can glaze some paint over the top. Another benefit of painting lightly is that it just gives you some more options later on. I'm not 100% sure that these lines are in the correct places right now, so if I want to change it later, it's not a problem. So after I have a few of these lines in and some of these reference points over to the right where the shadow is, I'm just going to glaze a thin layer of this paint over the top. That way I can switch over to my eraser and start pulling out this texture. I'm going back to this upper eyelid and I'm just going to do the same thing again by erasing right over it. The reason I have to clean this up is because as I was spraying paint around it, overspray got on here. That's always part of airbrushing. You always are going to get some overspray in areas you don't want. It's not really a big deal though because I just tell myself that I'll have to go back to an area that I painted around to lighten it up if it got too dark. A lot of the ways that the highlights and shadows were painted in Rembrandt's painting are in planes. And what a plane is, is basically a mass of value. Doesn't matter if it's light or dark, but it's basically going in a straight angle. You can see this right here, just above the upper eyelid. This is basically a straight diagonal of highlight. So as I'm erasing it out, I'm trying the best I can to follow that angle, try to erase in the same diagonal motion. If you're looking at my completed painting right now, you may notice that it's kind of on the messy side, and that's okay. As I continue to paint, I'll start tightening this up and adding more definition between the highlights and shadows. It doesn't matter what type of painting you're working on, it's always about building it up slowly in steps. So I'm just sticking with this eraser here, going around these areas over again. Just like before, I'm not only lightening up areas, but I'm also adjusting them. You know, if something seems a little bit off, I can slightly adjust the angle of it with the eraser. And just remember that I'm only sticking with that one flesh tone color that I showed the mixture for earlier in this video. I'll use a few different colors later on, especially for the shadows to alter the color temperature. But if you look over at Rembrandt's self-portrait, you can just see how advanced his color shifts were as he's shifting from a highlight to a shadow. Not only is Rembrandt altering the value, which is how dark and how light everything is, but he's also shifting the color temperature in between these values. Like for example, this highlight on the cheek right here has kind of an orange tone, and then as it shifts to the shadow, it switches more toward a maroon, almost reddish color. If I tried to copy all those color shifts, this painting would have taken me at least double the time. So I'm going to keep my colors simple and just focus on the values, working with a limited palette. But if you're working along with me and copying this one as well, and you want to paint in those colors, I say go for it. That's really one of the best ways to learn. Moving along to the left side of the face, along the cheek here, the first thing I'm doing is just separating that line from the face itself, from the portrait to the hair. And all I'm doing is using my shield here to get that hairline in, lightly spraying some paint over the top of it. The reason that I put that in is because I'm going to be adding in some of the flesh tone values here just to the left of the eye, and I don't want that hairline to get lost. So I'm going to be using my skin texture template here with that flesh tone in my airbrush, and I'm just lightly spraying it over it, moving it around. 
Every time I spray a small amount of paint, you'll see that I lift it up to look at what type of texture I got underneath. I wanna make sure I get an even texture across this whole area. The reason that I'm adding this texture in, and I do this on almost every portrait, is just to help break up that naturally soft look that you get from an airbrush. This isn't going to add to that painterly look or brush strokes. All it is is just some subtle texture in there so it doesn't look too smooth. From here, I'm going back to the airbrush freehand and I'm just gonna lightly spray some paint over this whole area. Just like before, I wanna spray a small amount of paint. I'll definitely have to go darker with this later, but for now, we're gonna keep it light because that way we could erase and scratch into it. And if there's anything we need to adjust later on, it's not gonna be difficult to do. I'm gonna continue adding this paint a bit lower because one thing that I really wanna get out here is this really bright highlight that Rembrandt has on his portrait. Underneath the eye sockets, which are called the orbits, there's a bone called the zygomatic bone. Sometimes people call it the cheekbone, but what it is is that area right underneath the eye that slightly protrudes. And because of the direction of the light source, Rembrandt painted this on very bright in this area where it's catching some light. So all I did here was use my eraser to erase that area out. We'll come back to a lot of these highlights later after we spray some more paint on here to darken the area. Once we put that on, we're obviously gonna need to lighten up the highlights more, so we'll use an eraser later on. But something common that you'll see across most of Rembrandt's portraits and self-portraits is his use of lighting. The light source for this portrait is above Rembrandt and to the left, and the easiest way to see that is to always just pay attention to the eye. Look where the specular highlight is. You can see on the left one, it's right here. And since it's above the pupil and just slightly over to the left, we know that's where the light is coming from. You can also see the brighter highlights on the face, but if you're new to portrait painting, the easiest way to tell is to always look at the eye and see where that specular highlight is. Rembrandt is definitely the one responsible for making this style of lighting so popular. And even to this day, if any of you are interested in photography, you'll know that this type of lighting is usually called Rembrandt lighting. Now, Rembrandt lighting isn't as exaggerated as that tenembrism style that you'll see in a lot of Caravaggio's works, but that style of lighting definitely influenced Rembrandt. But Rembrandt's is always a little bit softer, almost like the light is slightly diffused. I'll be talking a lot more about this lighting in next week's video and the influence of where Rembrandt got it from, but for now, let's just go back to the painting. Before I paint in any more of this cheek, what I wanna do is get in a few of these lines here that separate the highlights from shadows, and this is very similar to what I did before with that hairline. I'm placing this right over my initial line drawing, lightly spraying over it, then removing the shield. And you can see here just a thin line like that is just gonna help guide me. I'll do the same thing with this curve on the nose, just place the shield over, get some paint down. Now I know just to the left of that is the area that I'm gonna be working. Since I'm only using transparent paints for this painting, I don't have to worry about losing those lines that I painted in. A transparent paint is obviously see-through, it's transparent. So if I spray any of this flesh tone around this, that line's not gonna go anywhere. It's gonna stay right where it is. If anything, it'll get a bit darker. So I'm going back to that skin texture template and then just lightly spraying it over this whole area on the cheek to get an even layer of texture down. Now that we have some paint down and some texture, we can switch over to the eraser to start pulling out highlights. Normally, when I'm erasing out skin textures, I usually erase in a small circular motion. That gives a natural, organic look. But in this one, I'm erasing out a bunch of thin lines that are parallel to each other. In drawing, this is called hatching. The reason that I'm doing that here is trying to mimic the brush strokes that I see in Rembrandt's self-portrait. Now, in no way is this gonna be identical to actually using a paintbrush with opaque paint, but you could see here in a few areas that it's starting to look close, especially up here on the eyebrow. And I think just adding a few parallel lines up here in the same angle just really gives that painterly effect. And I think this part looks good for now, but if I accidentally erase too much of that paint out, it's never a problem with an airbrush. I say this in all my videos. All you need to do is go right back over to the airbrush with that same color in it, lightly glaze it over the top. That texture will still stay there, but you'll darken up the value. When you're using a paint with a weak binder like Createx Illustration Colors, and you're painting on a very smooth surface, you can soft erase into the paint. And that's what I'm doing here. I'm holding my eraser toward the back so I don't put too much pressure on it. And then just lightly scratching out some thin layers of paint in this area here. And to me, some of these soft lines just look like a plane of highlight that was painted in with a brush. So I'm gonna have to speed through some of this to keep this video length down. But all I'm doing here is that same thing over and over of building up those layers. And while I'm doing this, I'm constantly looking back at Rembrandt's original painting. 
I always print out multiple copies of the reference that I'm working from, and I usually just tape it on my painting in a place that I'm not working on. That way, as I'm painting, that reference is always right next to me. So let me show you another example here of erasing out highlights to make it look like a brush stroke. This area of the cheek has a subtle highlight on it, so I'm using my eraser, and you can see that I'm moving it pretty quickly and just trying to erase and scratch out a bunch of parallel lines. I'm definitely going for that flat, plain look, so I'm trying to erase these out in the same direction, and more importantly, in that same angle, going up toward almost like the top of the ear. And once a few of these lines are in like this, it doesn't look exactly like a paintbrush stroke, but it looks pretty close for an airbrush. And like I said in the beginning of the video, you'll never get it exactly to look like oil paint, you know, because that's an entirely different medium. But you can get your airbrush paintings to look different than that traditional overly soft airbrush look that we're so used to seeing. Now, would I use this same technique in my own portraits that I'm working on? Probably not. But I could see some times where a technique like this could be useful. And that's really what painting's about. It's just having a bunch of tricks at your disposal. And then when you come up to a new problem in your painting, which you of course will, you have something to reach for. You have a bunch of different options to, to go for. And that's why I can never stress enough how important it is to copy the artist that you most admire. Because even if the painting is difficult and it takes a long time, you're still going to learn something. So let's finish the first part of this video by painting in the nose. When I'm looking at the reference photo, I'm always looking for something that kind of stands out. Like what's the most obvious line on this part of the painting? And when looking at the nose, the most important line I'm seeing here is this line that separates the shadow below the nostril to the flesh tone above it. Rembrandt's nose is not going to be any different than any other portrait that I painted on this channel. So I'm doing the same thing by using the shield to spray in that nostril first. And then once I have a few of those lines in, I can switch over to freehand. And I'm just kind of mapping in the area where this cast shadow is going to be below the nose. There's a soft gradient on the bottom where it transitions from the dark cast shadow to a brighter area of the flesh tone. So I want to make sure I keep this pretty soft for now. And I can always use my eraser to clean up these lines. The way that the light hits and plays off this nose and then casts that shadow to the right is kind of the signature of Rembrandt lighting. And one thing about this is the shadows are going to be very dark in this part of the portrait. So I'll use the flesh tone in the beginning just to map in all these shapes and values. And then when I want to darken it up later on, I'm going to switch over to the same color mixture that has a fair amount of sepia mixed into it. The color temperature of that is going to be slightly cooler, so it's going to make the shadows look a bit more natural. So now that I have the major parts of the nose mapped in, the dark shadows underneath where the nostrils are, I'm going to switch over to freehand and start painting in the nose itself. Since that Rembrandt lighting light source is above him and to the left, I want to make sure that the right side of this is going to be the darkest. And the way you make it darker is just by putting more paint there. So I'm going to start on this right side and just work my way up the bridge of the nose. I'm using a shield right here just to spray in that transition between the highlight and the shadow. And I'll also use my shield to map in that dark cast shadow to the right of the nose. So now we have the entire nose in place. So I can go over freehand and then just start darkening all these values up. And at this point, the nose is, is kind of coming together, but it's just way too smooth. So we need to break it up. I'm going to go back to that skin texture template, just like before, lightly spray it over this whole area. You can see at this point that I may have sprayed too much paint there. The spots look a bit too dark. Again, it's not going to be a big problem because we're going to use the eraser later on to add some texture on the nose. And when we do that, a lot of this is just going to kind of blend into the background. So what I want to do from here is start darkening up the values. So I'm switching over to this new color, which I'm placing on the screen right now. And since this color has sepia in it, it's going to shift the color temperature to a cooler tone, meaning less orange. And I'm going to spray this over the right side of the nose. And you can just see right here that it definitely darkens it up. But the color temperature is slightly different than what you see on the highlight to the left of it. It's subtle for sure, but it takes some of that warmth, some of that reddish orange color out of the shadows. So what I want to do now is switch over to a large sand eraser to erase out this really bright specular highlight on the left side of the nose. This sand eraser is made by Tombow and it's very aggressive so I could just come into these highlights, add a bit of pressure, and it's going to remove the paint right down to the gesso. This eraser works amazing when you're pulling out softer large highlights. You can see here I'm just going over some of my other highlights on the left side and just lightening them up. And once I pulled out the highlights, I realized that the major values of the nose were still too light. So I'm going back to my airbrush with that initial flesh tone mixture 
spraying it over some areas to darken them. I'll also add some paint toward the top up here and just do this freehand where that dark cast shadow is being cast by the brow ridge. And because some of that paint got on this highlight here, I'm just coming back in with an ink stick eraser and just going over these highlights again to clean them up. When I'm working on any type of painting, my favorite erasing tool is without a doubt one of these stick erasers, just because you have so much control and they come down to a very sharp point. But sometimes if you want to pull out a very bright highlight, you need a lot of pressure and it's just kind of difficult to do with a stick eraser. So a better option for that is an electric eraser like the one I'm using here. This is very aggressive. All I do is tap it into the area where I don't want paint and it removes pretty much all of it right down to the canvas. This tool works great. I love using it, but you just need to be careful with it just because it removes so much paint. So at this point, I would say that the nose is pretty much complete. We're obviously going to need to paint in those cast shadows off to the right of it. And when we do that, we'll start pulling it all together. In next week's video, we're going to be painting the right side of the face where most of it is in that cast shadow. And we'll talk a lot more about Rembrandt lighting. And as always, I want to say thank you so much to the generous support of the channel members. I'd like to welcome Joshua, Adrian, and Svavar to the channel. And a special shout out and thank you to Herbert and NH, both of which joined at tier 3. So thank you so much, guys. And thank you to the current channel members, Fernando, Robert, Takuji, Airbrush Art and Customs, Hector, Mike, Peter C., Peter G., William, Rick, Robin, John, Adam, Jan, Rick, M. Webb, Leon, Mackie, Mark, Mere Creative, SM, Cyril, Michael, Carl, Dwayne, Pete, Ken, M. Shibley, and Ralph. You guys are all the best, and I can't thank you enough. So thank you all so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed this one, and I'll see you back here next week.